Hello, we're so glad to see you at Literature Out Loud, and that we're really happy to be able to present some of the words of Kent Harriff. His um, novel, Plain Song, is a beautiful piece. We can't present it all because it's too long, you know, so we're doing some excerpts. Lee Sullivan and I will be reading from Plain Song, and uh, I know you'll enjoy it. Kent Harriff was born in Pueblo, and he grew up with a knowledge of the Eastern Plains of Colorado, and he invented a town called Holt, Colorado, based roughly on Yuma. I don't know if you've ever been out there, but Kent was so involved in his writing that he would go to a little tiny room in his backyard and he would put like a stocking cap over his head so he couldn't see anything and he would type and go to Holt, Colorado to do his writing. And it shows. So we have some excerpts from a beautiful um, novel called Plain Song. And I would like to start it with my good friend and extremely talented human being, Lee Sullivan. Lee, would you please? I'll begin. This excerpt is titled The McFerrins. Maggie Jones drove out to the McFerrins on a cold Saturday afternoon, 17 miles southeast of Holt. Beside the blacktop, there were patches of snow in the fallow fields, drifts and scallops, wind hardened in the ditches. Black baldy cattle were spread out in the corn stubble, all pointed out of the wind, with their heads down, eating steadily. When she turned off onto the gravel road, Small birds flew up from the roadside in gusts and blew away in the wind. Along the fence line, the snow was brilliant under the sun. She drove up the track to the old house set back off the road a quarter mile. Beside the house, a few low elm trees stood leafless inside the yard that was closed in by wire hog fencing. When she got out of the car, a mottled old farm dog scuttled up to her and sniffed her leather boots. And she patted his head and went through the wire gate up to the house and knocked on the screen door. Above the steps was a little screen porch. The mesh mended in places with white cotton string where it had been torn or poked through with something sharp. Beyond was the kitchen. She went up the steps onto the porch and knocked again. <clears throat> she looked in. The kitchen was more or less orderly. The table was cleared of dishes and the dishes were laid in the sink, but there were stacks of farm journals and newspapers loaded up against the far walls and greasy pieces of machinery. Cogwheels, old bearings, shank bolts were set out on mechanics rags on each of the chairs, except the two that were placed opposite each other at the pine table. She opened the door and hollered in. Hello? Her voice echoed. It died out in the far room. She came back off the porch and out to the car. Now there was the far off sound of a tractor muttering and popping, coming up from the pasture to the south. She walked down to it and stood around the corner of the horse barn out of the wind. She could see them now. Both brothers were on the tractor. Raymond st standing up behind Harold, who sat behind the wheel driving an ancient red sun-faded farmall with the canvas wings of the heat houser bolted over the block onto the fenders for protection from the wind, pulling an empty flatbed hay wagon. They'd been feeding cattle out in the winter pasture, hay bales and pellets of cotton seed cake, scattering the cake in the feed bumps. They jolted through the gate and stopped and Raymond got off and swung the gate closed and climbed back on and they came banging and clattering past the corrals and past the loading chute up to the barn. The lid on the tractor's exhaust stack flapped with bursts of black smoke. Then they shut the engine off and the lid dropped shut. And suddenly Maggie Jones could hear the wind again. She stepped away from the barn and stood waiting for them. They got down and approached her slowly, calmly as deliberately as church deacons, as if they were not at all surprised to see it. They moved heavily in their winter coveralls and they had on thick caps pulled low 
and cumbersome winter gloves. You're going to freeze yourself standing there, Harold said. You better get out of the wind. Are you lost? Probably, Maggie Jones said. She left, but I wanted to talk to you. Oh, I don't like the sound of that. Don't tell me I scared you already, she said. Why hell, Harold said. You probably want something. I do, she said. You, you better come up to the house, Raymond said. Thank you, she said. At least one of you is a gentleman. They went back to the old house across the frozen lot in the wind. The dog came out to meet them and sniffed at her again and retreated once more into the open garage. They mounted the steps to the house. On the little porch, the brothers bent over and unbuckled their manure caked over shoes. Go on in, Raymond said, don't wait on us. She opened the door and entered the kitchen. The house was not warm, but it felt better out of the wind. They came in after her closed the door and took put their gloves off, set them on the counter where they looked as stiff as firewood, curled open in the permanent shapes of their hands. They unzipped the tops of their coveralls. Underneath, they wore black button-up sweaters, flannel shirts, and long underwear. You want any coffee, Raymond said. Oh, that's too much trouble, Maggie said. It's only what's left over from noon dinner. He set a pan on the stove and poured the coffee from the pot into it. Then he removed his cap and the hair stood up in short gray stiff shocks on his round head. She thought his head looked beautiful, had a clean, perfect shape. They both looked that way. Harold had removed the greasy pieces of machinery from one of the extra chairs and had dragged it up to the table. He sat down solidly. When they were inside the house, the McFarren brothers' faces turned shiny and red as beets. And the tops of their heads steamed in the cool room. They looked like something out of an old painting of peasants, laborers, resting after work. Maggie Jones unbuttoned her coat and sat down. I came here to ask you a favor, she said to them. That's so, Harold said. Well, you can always ask anyhow. What is it? Raymond said. There's a girl I know who needs some help, Maggie said. She's a good girl, but she's gotten into trouble. I think you might be able to help her. I would like you to consider it and let me know. Well, what's wrong with her, Harold said. She, she need a donation of money? No, she needs a lot more than that. What sort of trouble is she in, Raymond said. Well, she's 17, Maggie Jones said. She's four months pregnant and she doesn't have a husband. Well, yeah, Harold said. I reckon that could amount to trouble. I've had her staying with me in my father's house. I've had her staying with me in my house for a while, but my father won't accept her being there anymore. His mind's gone. He's all mixed up and sometimes he gets violent. He's made her afraid to be in the house with him. Well, what about her kinfolk, Harold said. Don't she have any family? Well, my father left her years ago. I don't know how many years exactly. Now, lately, her mother won't have her in the house. On account of her carrying the baby? Yes, Maggie said. Her mother has problems of her own. You probably know who I'm talking about. Who? Betty Rubidow. Oh, Harold said. Leonard's wife. Did you know him? Enough to drink with him. Whatever became of him, I wonder. Well, nothing good. You can bet on that. Well, he, he might have went to Denver, Raymond said. Then he, he might have went back to Rosebud in South Dakota. I doubt anybody knows. He's been gone a long time. But the girl's still here, Maggie said. That's my point. His daughter is still here. She's a good person, too. Her name is Victoria. Well, what about the sire, Harold said. Who? She said. Oh, you mean the baby's father? Where does he come into this? He doesn't. She won't even tell me who he is, except to say he doesn't live here. He lives somewhere else. He doesn't want her anymore, she says, or the baby either, apparently. Well, I, I don't know if he even knows about the baby, whether she told him. On the stove, the coffee had begun to boil. Raymond stood up and three set three cups out and poured out the coffee, the pan hissing wildly as he tipped it up. The coffee was black and thick as steaming tar. You take something in it, he said. Maggie looked in her cup. Maybe some milk. 
He brought a jar of milk from the refrigerator and set it on the table and sat down again. She took the lid off and poured a little into her cup. All right, then, Harold said. You got our attention. You say you, you don't want money. What do you want? She sipped from a coffee and tasted it and looked in the cup again, set it back on the table. She looked at the two old brothers. They were waiting, sitting forward at the table across from her. I want something improbable, she said. That's what I want. I want you to think about taking this girl in, of letting her live with you. They stared at her. You're fooling, Harold said. No, Maggie said, I am not fooling. They were dumbfounded. They looked at her, regarding her as if she might be dangerous. Then they peered into the palms of their thick, calloused hands spread out before them on the kitchen table. And lastly, looked out the window toward the leafless and stunted elm trees. Oh, I know it sounds crazy, she said. I, I suppose it is crazy. I don't know. I don't even care. But the girl needs somebody, and I'm ready to take desperate measures. She needs a home for these months, and you... Smiled at them, you old solitary bastard. You need somebody to, somebody who, or something besides an old red cow to pair about. You know, you know, lonesome out here. You're going to die someday without ever having had enough trouble in your life. Not of the right kind, anyway. This is your chance. The McFerrin brothers shifted in their chairs. They watched her suspiciously. Well, she said, What do you think? They didn't say anything. She laughed. I believe I have robbed you of speech. Will you at least think about it? Hell, Maggie, Harold said at last. Let's go back to the money part. Money'd be a lot easier. Yes, she said it would, but not nearly as much fun. Fun, he said. That's a nice word for what you're talking about. More like pandemonium and disruption, you mean. Jesus, God. All right, she said. I tried. I had to do that much. She stood up and buttoned her coat. You can let me know if you change your mind. She went outside to the car. They followed her and went down the little walk and stood at the wire gate in the freezing wind, waiting for her to back up and come forward in the rutted driveway, drive back out past the house towards the county road. As she passed, she waved at them. They lifted their hands and gestured back to her. When she had gone, they didn't talk to each other, but returned to the kitchen, drank down the coffee and the cups and put on their winter caps and gloves, pulled on their overshoes and buckled them, and went back down the porch steps into the yard and returned to work as mutely and numbly as if they had been stunned into a sudden and permanent silence by such a proposal. But later, when the sun had gone down in the late afternoon, after the sky had turned faint and wispy and the thin blue shadows that reached across the snow, the brothers did talk. They were out in the horse lot working on the stock tank. The tank had frozen over with ice. The shaggy saddle horses already winter coated stood with their backs to the wind, watching the two men in the corral, the horses' tails blowing out, the breath snorted out in white plumes and carried away in tatters by the wind. Harold chopped at the ice on the stock tank with a wood axe. He flailed at it, finally broke through into the water below. The head of the axe sunk and held deep out of sight and suddenly heavy. He pulled it out and chopped again. Then Raymond scooped out the ice chunks with his cob fork and flung the ice away from the tank under the hard ground behind him where it landed among other frozen blocks and pieces. When the tank was clear, they lifted the lid from the galvanized watertight box that floated in the water. Inside the box was the tank heater. When they looked inside, they could see that the pilot light had blown out. Harold took off his gloves, withdrew a long firebox match from his inside pocket, popped it on his thumbnail, cupped the little flame, and held it down inside the box. When the pilot light took, he adjusted the flame and drew his arm out. Then Raymond he wired the lid tight again. Then they checked the propane bottle that was standing out of the way. So for a while, they stood below the windmill in the failing light. The thirsty horses approached and peered at them, sniffed at the water, and began to drink, sucking up long droughts of it. Afterward, they stood back watching the two brothers, 
their eyes as large and luminous as perfect round knobs of mahogany glass. It was almost dark now. Only a thin violet band of light showed in the west on the low horizon. All right, Harold said. I know what I think. What do you think we do with it? We take her in, Raymond said. He spoke without hesitation, as though he'd only been waiting for his brother to start so they could have this out and settle it. Maybe she wouldn't be as much trouble, he said. Oh, I'm, I'm not talking about that yet, Harold said. He looked out into the gathering darkness. I'm talking about, why hell, look at us, old men alone, decrepit old bachelors out here in the country, 17 miles from the closest town, which don't amount to much to a good dam even when you get there. Think of us, crotchety and ignorant, lonesome, independent, set in all our ways. How are you going to change now at this age of life? Can't say, Raymond said. But I'm going to. That's what I know. And what do you mean? How come she wouldn't be no trouble? I never said she wouldn't be no trouble. I said maybe she wouldn't be as much trouble. Well, why wouldn't she be as much trouble? As much trouble as what? You ever had a girl living with you before? No, I ain't. You know that, Raymond said. Well, I ain't either. But let me tell you, the girl is different. They want things. They need things on a regular schedule. Why, a girl's got purposes you and me can't even imagine. They got ideas in their heads you and me can't even suppose. God damn it, there's the baby too. What do you know about babies? Nothing. I don't even know the first thing about them, Raymond said. Well then, but I don't need to have to know about babies yet. Maybe I'll have time to learn. Now, are you going to go in on this thing with me or not? Because I'm going to do it. Any. Whatever. Harold turned toward him. The light was gone in the sky. He couldn't make out the, feature of his, the features of his brother's face. There was only this dark, familiar figure against the failed horizon. All right. I will. I'll agree. I shouldn't, but I will. I'll make up my mind to it. I'm going to tell you one thing first. What is it? You're getting goddamn stubborn and hard to live with. That's all I'll say, Raymond. You're my brother. But you're getting flat, unruly, and difficult to abide. And I'll say one thing more. What? This ain't going to be no goddamn Sunday school picnic. No, it ain't. But I don't recall you ever attending Sunday school either. The second time she drove out there, she had the girl with her, beside her in the front seat of the car. The girl looked frightened and preoccupied, as if she were going to confession or jail or some other place that was so unpleasant that she was willing to go only under force of circumstance and nothing else. It was Sunday. A cold and bright day and the snow still as brilliant as glass under the sun with the wind blowing as usual in sudden but regular gusts so that outside, when they got beyond the town limits, it was the same as before, except that the wind had turned west in the night. The cattle, the same shaggy black baldy cattle spread out in the corn stubble as the day before, were still there. It was only as if the cattle had made a collective right face in the night when the wind had changed and had then gone on slicking up the spilled corn, wrapping their tongues around the dry corn husks, raising their heads and staring off into the distance all the time, chewing steadily. Maggie Jones had driven more than halfway to the McFerrins before the girl had said any word at all. Then she said, Mrs. Jones, would you stop the car? What is it? Please, would you pull over? Maggie slowed and steered the car off onto the rutted shoulder. A bank of snow alongside was packed into the barrow ditch from behind the car, and the white smoke-like exhaust tore away in the gusting wind. What is it? Are you sick? No. What is it then? Mrs. Jones, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, well, honey, you can. I don't know, the girl said. Maggie turned to face her. 
The girl was looking straight ahead with one hand on the door handle, sitting up rigid and tense in the seat as though she were waiting for the right moment to jump out and run. All right, I'll tell you again, Maggie said. I can't guarantee anything about this. Don't ask that, but you need to regard this as an opportunity. They called last night and said they'd take you in and they said they'd try it. That's a great deal for them to say. I think it'll be all right. You don't have to be at all afraid of them. They're about as good as men can be. They may be gruff and unpolished, but they don't mean anything by that. It's only they've been alone so much. Think of living your life alone for half a century and more like they have. It would do something to you. So you can't let their gruffness bother you or deter you. Yes, they are rough around the edges. Of course they are. They haven't been rounded off, but you'll be safe out there. You can still come into school, ride the bus back and forth and complete your coursework work as usual, but you have to try to remember what it's been like for them. Both their folks died in a highway truck wreck when those old men were younger than you are now. Afterward, they just quit attending school if they'd ever gone very much anyway, which I don't think they did. And they stayed at home and went to work ranching and farming. And that's all they've known in the world or had to know. Up to now, it's been enough. She stopped. She studied the girl's face to see what effect her talking had had. The girl was looking out over the nose of the car toward the straight two-lane highway. After a while, she said, but Mrs. Jones, do you think they'll like me? <laughs> yes, I do. If you give them a chance, they will. But it seems crazy to be going out here to live with two old men. That's right, Maggie said. But these are crazy times. I sometimes believe these must be the craziest times ever. The girl turned her head to look out the side window at the native pasture beyond the ditch and the fence line. The flower spikes of the soapweed stuck up like splintered sticks, the seed pods dry and dark looking against the winter grass. Do they have a dog? She said. There's an old farm dog. Do they have any cats? I didn't see any, but I would guess they do. I've never heard of a farm yet without at least one or two stray cats around to keep down the mice and rats. I'd have to quit my job at the Holt Cafe. I'd have to tell Janine. Yes, but you wouldn't be the first one to quit washing dishes for Janine. She expects that, does she? Yes. The girl continued to look out the window. Maggie Jones waited. Whenever there was a gust of wind, the car was rocked on its wheels. After a while, the girl turned back and faced forward again. You can go on if you want to, she said. I'm okay now. Good. Maggie said, I thought you would be. She steered the car back onto the blacktop and they drove down the narrow highway. After a time, they turned east onto the gravel country road and then onto the track which led back to the old house with the rusted hog wire strung around it and the stunted elm trees standing up leafless inside the rusted wire. Maggie stopped the car in front of the gate. She and the girl got out. The McFerrin brothers had been watching for them. They came out of the house at once onto the little screened porch and stood waiting for the women to come up to the house, but they neither spoke nor made any gesture. They looked as stiff and motionless as if they'd been shaped out of plaster and then stood up on the porch like two lifelike statues of minor saints. When she got out of the car, the wind had wrapped the girl's hair across her face so that her first view of the McFerrins was obscured by her own thick, dark hair but the old men had dressed for the occasion. They wore new shirts with pearl snaps and had on clean Sunday trousers. Their red faces were clean shaven and their iron gray hair was combed down flat on their heads with a considerable excess of hair oil, leaving it so heavy and stiffened that even the gusting wind couldn't move it. The girl followed Maggie Jones up onto the porch. Maggie made the introductions. Harold and Raymond McFerrin, she said, this is Victoria Robidoux. Victoria, this is Harold, this is Raymond. 
The two brothers stepped forward one after the other in a kind of vaudeville drill without yet looking directly into the girl's face and both shook her head, each in his own turn, giving her one quick, brisk, hard clench, squeeze and release, feeling her hand so small and soft and pliable in their own big, hard, calloused hands, and then stepped back. <clears throat> then they did look at her. She stood silently beside Maggie Jones in her winter coat and blue jeans, a young girl with long black hair and black eyes, carrying a red purse over the shoulder of her dark coat, but they couldn't tell whether she was pregnant or not. She seemed so young and so slight. Well, Harold said, I guess you better come on in the house. It's a booger out here. They let the girl enter the kitchen ahead of them. Then Maggie followed and they followed her. Inside it was apparent at once that the McFerrin brothers had made an effort. The sink was empty of dishes. The table was scrubbed clean. The kitchen chairs were free of the mechanics rags and the pieces of machinery they had held the day before. And the floor looked as hard swept as if an immigrant woman had used her broom on it. This here's the kitchen, Harold said, what you're looking at. Over here's the sink. Next to it's the gas range. He stopped. He looked about him. I reckon all that be more or less obvious to anybody. It don't require me to tell you. In here is the dining room and parlor. They moved farther into the house, into the two larger rooms, which were intersected by shafts of daylight since the cracked brown shades bracketed above the windows had been rolled up at some point years ago, leaving both rooms filled with unshaded light, as in a country schoolhouse or a rural train depot. In the first, the dining room, positioned under a hanging light fixture, was an old square walnut table supported by a heavy pedestal with four wood chairs gathered about it. The table had been cleared only very recently, and the sun-bleached outlines of books and magazines were still visible on its surface. Beyond, in the next room, were two worn-out plaid recliner chairs placed like housebroken outsized animals in front of a television set with a floor lamp located at exact equidistance between the chairs and piles of newspapers and farm journals spread on the linoleum at the chair's feet. The girl turned and looked, taking it all in. I expect you'd like to have an idea where your bedroom's at, Harold said. He motioned toward the small room off the dining room. They entered it. It was almost completely filled by an old soft double bed covered by an ancient quilt and standing against the inside wall was a heavy mahogany chest of drawers. The girl walked around the foot of the bed and opened the closet door. Inside were dusty cardboard boxes and the dark clothes of a man and woman hanging from a silver rod, the clothes so old that they were no longer black but almost purple. All this here's their room, Harold said. They used to sleep in here, this room. Your mother and father, Maggie said. After they was gone, he said, I expect we got to thinking if it is storage space. He glanced at the girl. Of course, you move things around however you want. Thank you, the girl said. Because we don't come in here, Raymond said. This'll be just yours alone. Our bedrooms is upstairs. Oh, she said. Yes, he said. Well, Harold said, and out here's where you step out. The girl turned toward him, questioning, right next door to you. Convenient. The girl looked puzzled yet. She turned to Maggie Jones. Don't look at me, Maggie said. I don't know what he's talking about. What? Harold said. Why, hell, you know, the commode, the indoor outhouse. Well, what do you call it? That'll do fine, Maggie said. Our mother always called it where you step out. Did she? That's what she always called it, he said. He scratched his head. Well, damn it, Maggie. I'm just trying to be proper. I'm just trying to get us started off on the right chalk. I don't want to scare her off already. Maggie patted his smooth, shaven cheek. You're doing just fine, she said. Keep going. 
They went out of the bedroom, and while the others waited in the dining room, the girls stepped into the bathroom, another small room. It had a sink and toilet and a freestanding enameled tub with a red hose and shower head coiled under the faucet at one end. On the shelves above the sink were various half-used jars of liniment and salve and corn huskers hand balm and tubes of back rub and sore muscle ointment and there was also tooth powder and denture adhesive and shaving equipment and hanging over one of the drying rods next to the bathtub together with two old towels was a single fresh new pink towel that still had the store tag stapled to it. The girl came back out of the room. Should I get my suitcase now? She said. I think that would be a good idea, Maggie Jones said. You need any assistance, said Raymond. No, thank you. I think I can do it, the girl said, and then went out through the kitchen to the car. When she had gone, Harold said, she ain't very big, is she? Why, she's just a little thing. She didn't even show the baby any that I can see. Not much yet, Maggie said. Some of her clothes are beginning to get tight. You'll notice it more when she takes her coat off. She's scared of us, Raymond said. She don't say much. What do you think, Maggie Jones said. Raymond looked out of the window toward the car where the girl stood at the trunk gathering her belongings. She don't have to be, he said. We wouldn't hurt her. We wouldn't do her a harm for anything in this world. I know that, Maggie said, but she doesn't know it yet. You'll have to give her time. The girl returned to the house carrying a single cardboard suitcase and dragging a plastic trash bag. These she took into the bedroom. They could hear her in the room, moving about on the wood floor, temporarily arranging things. Then she came back out. I'm afraid this is a hard trial for you, Raymond said to the girl. He was not looking at her, but peering past her into some distance of his own. But we want to hope. What I want to say is Her Harold and me, we want to think that you might come to feel a little at home out here in time. I mean, not right away, I don't guess. She looked at him, then at his brother. Thank you, she said. Thank you for letting me stay here with you. Well, you're welcome, Raymond said. You sure are. They stood awkwardly, inspecting the floor. Very well, then, Maggie said. I believe I've done my part, so I think I'll just go home and let you three souls get acquainted. The girl looked startled. On the McFerrin brothers' faces, there was the look of panic. You have to leave already, the girl said. I think so, Maggie said. I think I better. It's time. We thought you might stay to supper, Harold said. Wouldn't you care to do that? Another time, she said, I'll be back. She went outside, and the McFerrin brothers and the girl followed her out and stood on the little screened porch in the wind, watching until she had driven away in the car. Then they turned and came back inside and stood looking at one another from across the bare wooden table in the kitchen. Well, Harold said, I, I, I reckon... The house was quiet. From the outside came the faint sound of birdsong coming up from the red cedar trees next to the garage, and there was the rising and falling noise of the wind. I reckoned Raymond and me better go out and feed before it gets full dark, he said. Then we'll come back in. We'll have to see about getting some supper. The girl looked at him. It won't take us long, he said. What is it you're feeding? Cattle. Oh. Mother cows and heifers, Raymond said. Oh. The McFerrin brothers and the girls stood looking at one another. I guess I can get unpacked, the girl said. Why? The table had been cleared already, and the dishes washed and rinsed and left to dry. Raymond sat one end of the table, bent over the Holt Mercury newspaper spread out before him, reading, licking his finger when he turned the pages, his wire glasses low on his nose. 
While he read, he rolled the flat toothpick back and forth in his mouth without once touching it. Harold sat at the other end of the table. He was turned out from it, his knees spread open. He was rubbing black bear mountain mink oil into the thick leather of a work boot. And beside his chair, the other boot was flopped over empty on the patterned and cracked linoleum. Outside the house, the wind had risen higher than it had been in the afternoon. They could hear it crying around the house corners, heaving and whining in the bare trees. The dry snow was lifted by the wind and blown past the windows, and it carried in sudden gusts across the frozen yard under the farm light that hung from a telephone pole out back. The snow swirled and sped in the bluish light. In the house, it was quiet. Across the room, the door was closed. She had gone into her bedroom after supper, and they had not heard anything from her since. They didn't know what to think of this. They wondered, privately, if all 17-year-old girls disappeared after eating supper. When he had both boots oiled to his requirements, Harold stood up. He set them out in the kitchen where they gleamed mutely against the wall. Then he came back, crossed to her door. He stood listening with his head canted and his eyes staring. He knocked on the door. Victoria, he said. Yes, everything all right in there. You can come in, she said. So he entered her room. It was hers already. She had made it so. It was female now, cleaner and tidier, with little things set out in place. For the first time in half a century, someone had taken an interest in the room. The old cardboard boxes were pushed under the bed, and the, closet, and the clothes in the closet had been shoved back further into the dark. Against the wall, the old mahogany chest of drawers, its oval mirror darkened and finely cracked at the edges, had been dusted and polished and her belongings were now arranged on it. Hair ribbons and comb and brush, lipstick and liner, hair clasps, a little cedar box of jewelry whose lid was closed by a tiny brass lock. She herself was sitting up in the bed in a square-necked winter nightgown with a sweater pulled over her shoulders, a school book and a blue notepad propped up in her lap. While the lamp beside the bed cast yellow light onto her clear face and her shining dark hair. I just was wondering, he said, if you was warm enough in here. Yes, she said, it's fine. They're saying how it's supposed to get kind of cold tonight, is it? And this old house ain't very warm. Well, I'm fine, she said again. She watched him. He was standing just inside the door, his hands poked into his pockets, his weather-blasted face, red face shining in the lamplight. Anyhow, he said, he peered around. You think of something, you let us know. We don't know much about this sort of thing. Thank you, she said. He looked at her once more, and quickly, as some shy country animal might, and closed the door. In the dining room, Raymond sat at the table. He's waiting, curious. The newspaper held up, captured in his hands. She all right, he said. I guess so. She need more blankets? She never said she wanted any. Maybe we ought to get her some anyhow, in case. I don't know. Uh, you done with, you about done with that paper? It's gonna be a goddamn cold night tonight. Well, I told her that, she knows. Why don't you let me have the front page? You're done with that much. Raymond handed him the newspaper, and he took it and shook it out and began to read. After a while, Raymond said, well, what was she doing in there I mean, when you was inside her room? Nothing. Reading. Working over her school books. Was she in bed? Harold looked up at him. I don't know where else she was going to be. Harold looked up. So Raymond stared back at his brother. Then Harold began to read again. The wind blew and whistled outside. After a time, Raymond spoke again. She didn't eat very much supper, he said. I don't think she did. Harold didn't look up. I reckon maybe she just don't like steak. Oh, she ate enough. She's just a small eater. I don't know if she did. I, she didn't hardly touch none of what I give her. I had to scrape most of it to the dog. Did he eat it? Who? Did the dog eat it? 
Well, what in hell do you think? Of course he didn't. Well, Harold said. He looked up again now, peering at his brother from above the top of the newspaper. Not everybody likes their beefsteak covered in black pepper. Who doesn't? Victoria, maybe? He bent back to the newspaper, and Raymond sat at the table watching him. His face took on a disturbed and arrested look, as though he'd been caught in some sudden dis sudden and disquieting act. You think she didn't like my cooking, he said. I wouldn't know, Harold said. The wind howled and cried. The house creaked. An hour later, Raymond stood up from the table. I had never considered that, he said. Considered what? About peppering her steak. He started upstairs, and Her Harold followed him with his eyes. Where are you going? Up. To bed already? No. He went on. Harold could hear him walking on the pine floorboards overhead. Then he came back down, carrying two thick wool blankets that smelled of dust and disuse. And he carried them to the front door, stood in the open doorway, and the howling gusts of snow and wind shook them out. Afterward, he crossed to the door, and tapped lightly, not wanting to wake her if she were asleep. There was no sound from inside. He stepped in and found that the girl was lying deep under the covers and that the light from the high purple farm light outside was shining palely onto the bed. He stood for a quiet moment looking at, at the room and all its new disturbances and the things in it. Then he spread the two blankets over her in the bed. Then he turned to come back out, Harold was standing in the doorway watching. They came out together and left the door slightly ajar. I didn't want her to take a chill, Raymond said, not on her first night. Later in the night, she woke up sweating and shoved the blankets aside. In December, the girl appeared in the doorway of Maggie Jones's classroom during the teacher's planning hour. Maggie was sitting at her desk, marking student papers with a red ink pen. Mrs. Jones, the girl said. The teacher looked up. Victoria, come in. The girl entered the room and stopped beside the desk. Nobody else was in the room. The girl was heavier now, beginning to show, and her face looked wider, fuller. Her blouse had drawn more tightly over her stomach, making the material appear polished and shiny. Maggie set the papers aside. Come around here, she said. Let me look at you. Well, my, yes, you're getting there, aren't you? Turn around. Let me see you from the side. The girl did so. Are you feeling all right? It's been moving lately. I've been feeling it. Have you? She smiled at the girl. You seem to be eating enough. Is there something you wanted? You don't have a class now? I told Mr. Guthrie I had to be excused to the restroom. Is something wrong? The girl glanced around the room and looked back. She stood beside the desk and picked up a paperweight and put it back. Mrs. Jones, she said, they don't talk. Who doesn't? They don't say more than two words at a time. It's not just to me. I don't think they even talk to each other. Oh, Maggie said. The McFerrin brothers, you mean them. It's so quiet out there, the girl said. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. We eat supper. They read the paper. I go into my room and study. And that's about it. Every day it's like that. Is everything else all right? Oh, they're kind to me, if that's what you mean. They're nice enough. But they don't talk, Maggie said. I don't know if they even want me out there, the girl said. I can't tell what they're thinking. Have you tried talking to them? You know you could start a conversation yourself. The girl looked at the older woman with exasperation. Mrs. Jones, she said. I don't know anything about cows. Maggie laughed. She laid the red pen down on the stack of student papers and leaned back in her chair, stretching her shoulders. Do you want me to talk to them for you? I know they mean well, the girl said. I don't think they mean any harm. 
Two days later that week in the afternoon after school was let out for the day, Maggie Jones discovered Harold McFerrin standing in front of the refrigerated meat case at the rear of the Highway 34 grocery store on the east side of Holt. He was clenching a package of pork roast to his nose. She walked up beside him. This look recent to you, he said. He held the meat out toward her. He looks bloody, she said. I can't tell if it smells good. They got it wrapped up in all this goddamn plastic. You couldn't tell the working end of a skunk with this stuff on it. I didn't know you ate skunks. That's what I'm talking about. I can't tell what I'm eating with this goddamn plastic wrapped around it. It ain't like our own beef from the meat locker. When we get it, I know what I'm getting. He shoved the pork roast back into the meat case and picked up another package. He held it close to his face, sniffing at it, grimacing, his eyes squinted. He turned it over and peered suspiciously at the underside. Maggie watched him, amused. I was hoping I'd run into you, she said, but I guess it'll have to wait. I wouldn't want to interrupt your shopping. Harold looked at her. What for? what I do now? Not enough, she said. Neither one of you has. He lowered the meat package and turned to face her. He was dressed in his work clothes, warm jeans and his canvas chore jacket, and on his head, canted toward one ear, was an old dirty white hat. What are you talking about, he said. You and your brother want to keep that girl out there with you, don't you? Why, yeah, he said. What's the trouble? He looked surprised. Because you think it's kind of nice having a girl in the house, don't you? You've gotten kind of used to having her out there with you, hmm? Where'd we go wrong, he said. You're not talking to her, Maggie Jones said. You and Raymond don't talk like you should to that girl. Women want to hear some conversation in the evening. We don't think that's too much to ask. We're willing to put up with a lot from you men, but in the evening we want to hear some talking. We want to have a little conversation in the house. What kind, Harold said. Any kind, just so you mean it. Well, damn it, Maggie, Harold said. You know I don't know how to talk to women. You knew that before you ever brought her out there. And Raymond, he don't know a thing about it either. Neither one of us does, in particular, a young girl like her. That's why I'm telling you, Maggie said, because you better learn. But damn it, what would we talk to her about? I expect you'll think of something. She said no more. Instead, she walked away into one of the aisles of the grocery store, pushing her shopping cart ahead of her, her long dark skirt swirling briskly about her legs. Gazing after her, Harold followed her progress with considerable interest, watching from under the dirty brim of his hat. In his eyes, there was a look of mystification and alarm. When he returned to the house, it was just before dark. Raymond was still outside. He located him out back of the horse barn and pulled him into one of the plank-sided stalls as if there were a need for privacy. With some excitement in his voice, he reported to Raymond what Maggie Jones had said to him in the Highway 34 grocery store while he stood before the meat case considering pork roast for their supper. Raymond received the news in silence. Afterward, he looked up and studied his brother's face for a moment. That's what she said. Yes, that's what she said. That's all of it, sum in total, all I can remember. Then we got to do something. That's what I think too, Harold said. I'm talking about we got to do something today, Raymond said, not next week. That's what I'm telling you, Harold said. I'm trying to agree with you. The McFerrin brothers made their attempt that same evening. They had decided it was safe to wait until after supper, but believed they could wait no longer. After supper, they sallied forth together. They and the girl had just finished eating a meal of fried meat and red onions, boiled potatoes, coffee, green beans, sliced bread, and equally divided portions of canned peaches, bright yellow in their own syrup. It had been the customary, nearly silent evening meal eaten almost formally out in the dining room. And afterward, 
The girl had cleared the square walnut table of their dishes and had taken the dishes to the kitchen and washed them and put them away. And then she was started back to her bedroom when Harold said, Victoria, <clears throat> he had to clear his throat. He started again. Victoria, Raymond and me was wanting to ask you a question, if you don't mind, if we could, before you started back to your studies there. Yes, she said. What did you want to ask? Oh, we was just wondering, uh, what you thought of the market? The girl looked at him. What? She said. On the radio, he said, the man said today how soybeans was down a point, but that live cattle was holding steady. And we wondered, Raymond said, what you thought of, buy or sell, what you said. Oh, the girl said. She looked at their faces. Uh, the brothers were watching her closely, a little desperately, sitting at the table, their faces sober and weathered, but still kindly, still well-meaning, with their smooth white forehead shining like polished marble under the dining room light. I wouldn't know, she said. I couldn't say about that. I don't know anything about it. Maybe you could explain it to me. Well, sure, Harold said. I reckon we could try, because the market, but maybe you would like to sit down again first at the table here. Raymond rose at once and pulled out her chair. She seated herself slowly, and he pushed the chair in for her, and she thanked him. And he went back to the other side of the table and took his place. For a moment, the girl sat rubbing her stomach, where it felt tight. Then she noticed they were watching her with close interest, and she put her hands forth on the table. She looked across at them. I'm listening, she said. Do you want to go ahead? Why, sure, of course, Harold said. As I was saying, he began in a loud voice. Now, the market is what soybeans and corn and live cattle and Jew wheat and feeder pigs and bean meal is all bringing in today for a price. He reads it out every day at noon, the man on the radio. Six dollar soybeans, corn, two forty, fifty eight cent hogs, cash value sold today. The girl sat watching him talk, following his lecture. People listen to it, he said, and know what the prices are. They manage to keep current that way, know what's going on. Not to mention pork bellies, Raymond said. Harold opened his mouth to say something more, but now he stopped. He and the girl turned to look at Raymond. How's that? Harold said. Say again. Pork bellies, Raymond said. That's another one of them. You never mentioned it. You never told her about them. Well, yeah, of course, Harold said. Them, too. I was just getting started. You can buy them, too, Raymond said to the girl, if you had a mind to. He was looking at her solemnly across the table. Or sell them, too, if you had some. What are they? The girl said. Well, that's your bacon, Raymond said. Oh, she said. Your fat meat under the ribs there, he said. That's right, Harold said. They're touted on the market, too. So anyway, he said, looking at the girl, now, do you see? When she looked from one old man to the other, they were waiting, watching for some reaction, as if they'd been laying out the intricacies of some last will and testament, or perhaps the uh, necessary precautions to take against the onset of a fatal disease and the contagion of the plague. I, I, I don't think so, she said. I don't understand how he knows what the prices are. The man on the radio. Harold said, yes. Well, they call them up out of the big cell barns. He gets the market reports from Chicago or Kansas City or Denver, maybe. Then how do you sell something, she said. All right, Raymond said, taking his turn. He leaned forward toward her to explain these matters. Um, take, for instance, you want to sell you some wheat, he said. Take you already got it there in the elevator in Holt, next to the railroad tracks where you carried it back in July at harvest time. Now, you want to sell some of it off. So you call up the elevator. You tell him to sell off 5,000 bushels, say. So he sells it at today's prices. And then the big grain trucks, those tractors and trailers you see out on the highway, they haul it away. Well, who does he sell it to, the girl said. Any number of places, most likely to the milling company. Mostly it goes for your baking flour. Then when do you get your money? He writes you out a check today. Who does that? The elevator manager. 
except if there's a storage charge, Harold said, taking his turn again. He takes that out, plus your drying charge if there is one, only since it's wheat we're talking about, there's never much drying charge with wheat. Mostly that's with your corn. They stopped again and studied the girl once more. They had begun to feel better, a little satisfied with themselves. They knew they were not out of the woods yet, but they had begun to allow themselves to believe that what they saw ahead was at least a faint track leading to a kind of promising clearing. They watched the girl and waited. She shook her head and smiled. They noticed the how beautiful her teeth were, how smooth her face. She said, I, I still don't think I understand. When you said something about cattle, what about them? Oh, well, Harold said, okay, now with cattle. And so the two McFerrin brothers went on to discuss slaughter cattle and choice steers, heifers and feeder calves, explaining these two. Between the three of them, they discussed these matters thoroughly late into the evening, talking, conversing, venturing out into various other matters a little too. The two old men and a 17 year old girl sitting at the dining room table out in the country after supper was over, after the table was cleared, while outside, beyond the house walls and the curtainless windows, a cold blue norther began to blow up one more high plains midwinter storm. Lee, that's so beautiful. And I gotta say, Kent Harroff paints with words like nobody I know. That's so lovely. And if you have never read Plain Song, I would recommend it highly to you, along with the sequel called um, Even Song. And Kent Harriff has written other beautiful, beautiful pieces as well. Not short stories, but well worth it. Now, next month, we will be looking forward to hearing from some Aspen authors, James Salter, Joe Henry, and Sandy Monroe. Should be lovely. And once again, we owe everything to Thunder River Theater and to the lovely Sean Jeffries that makes us sound good. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for watching us. Bye-bye.